My name is Jacob Evans. I'm originally from Martinsburg, West Virginia, and most people have no clue where that is. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is that it's in the eastern panhandle, which is uh, at the very tip of the state, um, bordering Virginia and Maryland. So it's super close to Baltimore, um, really close to D.C., and super close to northern Virginia. And growing up, um, you know, I grew up in a really successful family. Uh, my dad was one of five children. My mom was one of four. Both of them completely self-made people. Um, my dad wound up being a family practitioner for dentistry, um, put himself through college, put himself through dental school. My mom um, started working in the federal government and wound up working her way up to being a presidential appointee, which is essentially one step below a cabinet, a cabinet member still confirmed by the Senate and confirmed by Congress. So my parents were really, really, really successful. And they're completely self-made people. So I wouldn't say that excellence was a standard, um, but doing my absolute best was expected. And so growing up, um, you have that as your parents, you have this certain um, expectation that you really place on yourself, not necessarily from them, but you want to be successful too. And I can remember being about four or five years old and just talking to my dad um, about how was it he got to where he was. And I was a, I was an interesting child. I thought I probably overthought more <laughs> than what most children do. And um, he told me that it was all bred from hard work. And the family motto was hard work brings good luck. So that was instilled on me at a very young age. Um, most kids in my neighborhood, because um, we were a more affluent neighborhood, um, didn't have chores and things like that, but I did. So I was, this work ethic was instilled in me. I can remember being um, in first or second grade and bringing home a report card. And in that report card, I had B's. And my parents told me that that meant that I left information behind. So um, that kind of gives you a background as to how my family operated. And so as I went through school, I, I continued to, to do pretty well. Um, I, I was, for the most part, always always A's, sometimes some B's. Um, but I, I also was somebody who got in trouble a lot as a kid. And it took one therapist um, going in and speaking on my behalf, they were trying to put me on Ritalin. Um, again, I was in school, in elementary school back in the early 90s. That was like the huge Ritalin push of the 90s. And so because I had these behavioral issues, they were trying to put me on medication super early. And one therapist stood up and was like, everything that this kid is showing is showing us that he's, he's gifted, not that he's challenged. So we need to be challenging him in other ways. So that meant that I went into more difficult classes. <laughs> and um, when I went into these other difficult classes, I started doing a lot better in school, just in terms of my performance, um, not necessarily getting in trouble, um, but still, like, I was I was bored. And so I wound up uh, getting in trouble at about fifth grade um, just for, for being for being a kid. And the school had kind of had it with with me being a behavioral issue. So I got suspended for one day. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back for my parents. Because again, the school tried to push medication. And so I wound up going into, into Catholic school at that point. And when I went into private Catholic school, it was a much, much, much smaller um, environment. Uh, a lot more strict in terms of an environment, a lot more challenging in terms of scholastics, uh, but still like a completely different arena from what I was in before. And when I went in there, I can remember my sixth grade uh, religion class, I asked a question about um, the Bible and I was like, you know, why are there quotation marks within the Bible? And that teacher who I had at the time didn't feel like answering the question and wound up kicking me out of religion class. And that created this negative relationship that I had, um, you know, with the higher power at a young age, anything that was religious based or anything along those lines. Um, I stayed away from it. I wanted nothing to do with it because as opposed to an authoritative figure 
kind of discipling me and helping me understand, um, I was, I was ostracized for having a question and I was kicked out of religion class until, um, I graduated from that school. So that created a really negative relationship. And as opposed to, you know, um, having like a value system or having something that I could fall back on, the only thing that I had was my family motto, which is hard work brings good luck. I didn't have like a strong structural foundation in in religion or spiritual practices at all. So I wasn't learning like those core values. Um, And then on top of that, my parents were both very career driven. So when it comes to, um, you know, the development of a child and like having that, um, like they were, they were doing their, you know, their thing. And like we, and those in those times for that generation, I think that a lot of parents were really career focused and career driven. And a lot of times what it led to, to being was, you know, sometimes dinner with the family. Um, sometimes everybody would be there together and then, um, the weekends and like, that was about it. And most of my weekends were spent doing yard work and things along those lines. So the familial aspect, although it was, it was strong, like I feel very connected to my parents I, um, I didn't necessarily have like the, the upbringing and like the values and the culture and things along those lines. I was taught honesty and I was taught hard work. And so as I progressed through, I was now in ninth grade, um, still doing very, very, very well scholastically. Uh, my brain started going crazy because now I'm thrown back into a bigger pool with a lot of other kids. And again, um, super close to Baltimore, super close to DC. So it's more urbanized. And because of that, <laughs> for my high school, um, I'm now exposed to a lot of other things. There's a lot of other stuff going on around me that wasn't happening in the Catholic school before. So in ninth grade, um, I'm in a band that I, I play guitar. So I, I was in a band where I was writing my own music and everything. Um, 14 years old, one of the youngest people on this circuit. I was playing with like 18 to 25 year olds. So again, I'm being exposed to even more stuff. And I was also doing super well scholastically. I was um, in jazz band. I was a football player. Um, I was looking back on it now. I was trying to find where I fit and where I belonged. So I always felt like I didn't. I mean, again, um, being told by school administrators, I need to be on medication i didn't fit the mold um religion class whenever i was in sixth grade being told i couldn't participate um i didn't feel like i belonged anywhere so i was looking for that anywhere i could find it within high school and i was being exposed to things like marijuana drinking um whenever i was 14 and so as my band continued to progress i wound up um dissolving that band joining jazz band show choir bar city football player um and then still playing these circuits with another band and that was when i first started smoking weed and for me when i was exposed to to weed for the first time it was like i instantaneously had a friend group and i instantaneously felt like i belonged somewhere And that was a feeling that I felt like I'd been searching for my entire life. And unfortunately for me, I'm a, I'm a creature of excess because, you know, I I had that mentality, hard work brings good luck. Well, I do everything to the extreme, not just working hard in school or working hard on whatever project it is that I'm doing, like, but also going hard whenever it comes to, to partying and having fun with, with those specific substances. So I was doing a lot more of it than what most people were. And it was, I would consider it pretty much um, recreational throughout throughout high school. Um, I got in trouble here and there with my parents telling me that, like, I shouldn't be doing this thing. Um, got in trouble with, like, a school cop one time. Um, but still doing pretty well throughout high school. Graduated um, honor roll. Graduated um, from jazz band, show choir, um, varsity football player. Um, graduated with a scholarship to go to college. An interesting thing is that um, my dad had always thought that I was going to be a dentist and take over his practice. So I had applied to something called the Dent Step Program, 
which is something that's really unique to West Virginia, where you can be pre-accepted into dental school upon leaving high school. And I applied for this thing out of 1,500 applicants. They only accepted so many, and I was one of the students that they accepted. So I had like my future planned out for me. <laughs> and I went into college and um, was still playing in, in a like in a band, and I decided that I wasn't going to do any sort of experimental drugs until I entered into college. And within my first week of school, um, being away from home, I had done cocaine, acid, ecstasy, and shrooms. And so I did all of those things within a week. They completely changed the way that I felt about things. Um, I started overthinking and... <laughs> realized that if I were to follow through with the plan that I had, I was literally going to live my dad's exact life. I was going to grow up. Um, I was going to wind up building a house less than a mile from where I grew up, just like he did. Um, his Our house was a mile away from where he had grown up. Um, I was going to wind up marrying some girl from my hometown or nearby, and I was going to take over his dental practice, and that was going to be it. I was going to work for the next 30 years, and I was going to retire in the same town I grew up in. <laughs> And that scared the crap out of me. <laughs> I wanted nothing to do with that story because I had seen itself play out and I had been the byproduct of that story and I knew how I felt. So I don't know if it was the right decision or not, but I was like, I'm going to drop out of school and pursue music. <laughs> and so I um, finished a whole year um, and then I did another series of LSD trips. And that was whenever I actually set the, the course in the motion. And I withdrew from school, didn't tell my parents about it, um, just pursued music for the next couple of months until inevitably like they found out. <laughs> and then they asked me what my plan was, and I told them that my plan was to, to move to California. And they said that I couldn't do that without having a um, solid plan, so I, I went and got my recording engineering certification. And during this time uh, was probably like the heaviest – use of psychedelics that I had in terms of LSD, ecstasy, um, and then a lot of cocaine as well. And I remember it went on for about like four or five months. And I remember being inside of the recording studio and looking at this person who was pretty much my mentor um, and seeing that he was wearing like these acid wash jeans. He had this skin tight t-shirt, um, flannel, uh, hair, like longer hair, but he was balding up on top. And it hit me all at once. It's like, man, this guy is stuck in the same era that he came in and started doing this. And I looked down at myself and I examined myself from the feet up. And I asked myself, is, you know, am I the person that I want to be for the rest of my life? And the answer, of course, was a resounding no. I was like, I need to go off and go, go grow more. And the only place where I know where that happens is college. So with that being said, I decided to go back into college, um, except this time because I had the ability to write music, record music, um, play music. I was like, the one thing I can't do is represent myself if I ever needed to. So I decided that I would go and pursue a legal education. And when I went back to school, um, I was like, I'm not going to do the same things. I'm not going to use psychedelics anymore. Um, and I put myself up on this pedestal. It's like, you know, so long as it's just like cocaine and alcohol and maybe some weed here and there, I'll be okay. And so um, when I went back into school, I dove full in. I became academic chair of a fraternity, rose the GPA, um, like the cumulative GPA up 1.2 points. Um, I got involved in student government and became one of the highest grossing um, vote winners uh, in WVU history for an individual. Um, I also started participating in something called National Model United Nations, where basically you reenact um, what it looks like to be in the United Nations and you work with schools from all over the world. And so you get really um, culturally sensitive and learn how to work with different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, so all across the board, like I was hitting all these marks, I was Dean's List, doing, um, I was super, super, super on point with things, and people would have never guessed that I had this background thing going on where I was drinking every single night. And I was somebody who, um, like, I was, I, was, I was different in the fact that a lot of people drink every night in college, but I was somebody who, even if I went to the bar with a certain group of friends, 
that's not who I was leaving the end of the night with. I would meet other people who wanted to stay out even longer and then eventually go with those people back to their house and hang out with those people. I was always the last one standing. And so that mentality of hard work equals playing hard like continued to fuel my day-to-day processes. And you fast forward a little bit at, um, through college, I was still being super, super, super successful um, when it came to what it looked like on paper. Um, I eventually became student body vice president, um, was accepted into law school, um, was a highly decorated National Model United Nations delegate. Um, I had FaceTime with many, 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 many school administrators. Nobody would have guessed what all was going on with me. And on one particular trip um, for National Model United Nations, uh, there was a student who had this substance, and it was this little blue pill. And he asked me if I wanted to try it. I saw him snorting it. And I was like, nah, dude. Uh, like I was on some sort of pedestal or something. Like, no, dude, I only put cocaine up my nose. And then he looked at me and he was like, well, you can smoke these if you want. And I was like, oh, really? And so I was like, show me how. And so he showed me how he did it. He put this little blue pill on a piece of foil, put a lighter underneath of it. And I watched this thing trail down as he chased the smoke with this pen. And I was like, I'll try that. So I grabbed a hold of it and I tried it myself. And it was like a switch went off. And the only way to really describe it is that for my entire life, I had felt this anxiety or this um, this pressure around trying to fit in or find my place, um, like a certain kind of excitement and trying to find who I was. And when I did that drug, it was a Percocet 30, when I did that drug, um, I didn't care anymore. And it was like everything I had been worried about for the last 22 years of my existence didn't matter. And it was a good feeling because I hadn't, had never experienced anything like that before. And so over the course of the next four days, which was the extent how long this trip was, um, I was doing those all the time um, throughout the entire course of the trip. And as I was getting back into West Virginia from New York City, we rode this bus. Like, I was used to these trips. I was used to feeling super tired, um, like, worn down, almost sick because you're putting in, like, 12 hours a day. But this feeling was different. And I couldn't really describe it. Just, like, my stomach felt like it was in knots. Um, I felt like I had the flu. And And I didn't know what all was going on with me. I knew that it was different, though. And as I'm getting off the bus, the guy who originally, like, started me on this path looked over at me and was like, hey, if you ever need any more of those, um, all you got to do is call me. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. And when I got back to my house, like, the feeling just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And little did I know, um, all it took me was four days, and I'd become physically addicted to opiates. And I had like such a high level of expectancy in terms of being able to perform in law school and all these other things um, that I wasn't prepared for for feeling that sick um, for the length of time whenever I was looking it up for the length of time that I thought that it was going to take to overcome it. And so I didn't want to feel sick. So um, my response was to get more. And that started a two-year struggle where I was using it every single day um, for two years because for me, I had to do it in order to stay somewhat on point. I I wasn't using to have fun anymore at that point. I was using to not feel that feeling anymore, and it only took me four days to do it. Um, I got through my first year of law school. I finished doing the student body vice presidency. Um, I was managing a suit store at the time while going to school full-time. Um, and managing this addiction. And so I slowly started um, cutting back those responsibilities. So the student body vice presidency ended around June after my first year. Um, And then I worked throughout the summer, and then I stopped working at that suit store going into the second year saying that I needed to focus on on school whenever in reality it was just that I was getting sick more often because the um, habit was becoming more expensive. So I couldn't predict whether or not I was going to be able to make it there. And I didn't want to leave the store in a, you know, in a dire position. So 
my responsibility started becoming less and with less time the only thing that happened was that I started using more and because I was using more um, I was getting sicker faster uh, and, and it just was painful overall and so going into my second year I was up to about eight pills a day um, and just it was miserable in terms of me being able to to operate and function daily and when I was going through these classes it was like I was showing up later and later and later um, I was starting to get emails from my professors saying that you know my tardiness was reflecting in my in my grades so if you're tardy so many times and it starts to deduct you whole letter grade points and so I can remember it like it was yesterday it was um, about two days after my birthday um, I had this class called cyber law and I wasn't doing this class because of what it actually was I thought that it was going to be what my mom had focused on she was in charge of cybersecurity for the entire United States like I was like oh this is going to be cybersecurity it'll be cool to learn a little bit about what all it is that my mom does uh, well that's not what the class was the class was actually something um, pertaining to online copyright I don't know why I stayed in it I, I had absolutely zero interest in online copyright um, but I decided to stay within this course and <clears throat> I remember getting this sticky note on my desk from the professor and all that it said was I need you to stay after for class so we can talk and so I gave her like the thumbs up and figured it was going to be another one of those conversations that I had with a teacher who was like hey you know you're being tardy you can't be tardy and so when I went to go speak to her um, she pulled out this sheet of paper and was like I need to, to show you something and she started going through the dates and was like tardy 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 one time tardy 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 one time tardy 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 one time and she's like Jake you're you're less than a month and a half into the school year and you've been tardy um, more than what you've been on time and she's like and so much to the point where if you're tardy again you're not going to be able to take the final and she's like and you have a 96 average in this class if you don't include these tardies she's like something's not right and I just need to know like are you okay and I don't know what it was about the way that she asked that question. I don't know if it was that I was like so run down at that time and it had been so long since I heard somebody ask me and genuinely be curious. But what I like to believe is that I knew that she was actually available to hear my answer. And so in that moment, like I saw two, two very distinct um, road paths. One where I pulled myself up on my bootstraps, which is what my dad would have done and, you know, got through it sees get degrees mentality and started a lawyer profession still managing an addiction um, until the wheels fell off or I go the opposite direction and I accept the help and again like I, I think that maybe it's the fact that you know I was so sick of just like feeling sick every single day I couldn't make it through an entire class without using um, I would have to get up in the middle of class and like go use I was um it was a struggle every single day to feel well. Um, I would have to manipulate and and like lie and and move things around. Like I had this um, I had this this fund that I had put together since I was about ten years old, just from like pocket money. And then my first couple jobs where I was saving up all this money for my retirement and Roth IRA. And, uh, and I pulled all that money out, everything that I had accumulated. Um, like I was just doing things that I should not have been doing in order to support my habit. And I think that that pressure had built up so much that when the right person asked me at the right time, um, I was ready to admit it to somebody. And plus, I think also like me having this ideal or this idealization of, of who I was and like the public image that I wanted to have as being this a you know, super involved, really successful, hardworking guy, the minute that some, I knew somebody knew, um, that was also enough for me. And so I told her everything. And um, it was hard. Uh, I definitely cried because um, it was my first time ever admitting weakness. Before, I'd always thought that I had a plan. Um, it didn't really matter. 
on what all would happen. I always felt like I would land on my feet. And this was the first time after, you know, a handful of times of me trying to stop on my own that I knew that the rubber had hit the road and it was, it was time for me to actually get the help. And the crazy thing was, was that when I told her, she, she didn't judge me. Um, and said it was very much the opposite. She wanted to help. And I just told her, I, like, I don't know what to do after this. And she's like, well, the first thing that we need to do is that we need to go figure out how to get you help. So let's go talk to the dean. And so now I'm walking into the dean's office, you know, slobbering, a whole mess, like just admitted my, you know, my, my life's Achilles heel um, to one woman who I barely knew. I'm like, now I'm going to go march into the dean's office who I also like barely know. And I'm going to be doing the same thing again. Um, the only thing that they know me for is like my grades and my accolades. And so I walk in and she's like, Jake needs to tell you something. And then Dean just looks over at me. And so I, again, I see the two roads and I just spill it out to her as well. And again, the second time where I wasn't met with negativity, I was met with how can we figure out a way to help you? Let's get you to take the time that you need in order to get this thing done right. Um, and then you can come back and finish your law degree at a later date and I was just in, in awe of how I was feeling this this surrounding or this rallying behind me to figure this thing out um, but the one thing that was lingering in the back of my head was um, you know, what am I going to tell my parents because I look like on paper it looks like I'm a golden child um, like I, I wasn't doing anything wrong and so how do I admit this to them that I've been struggling with this for so long and I need help and I can't do it on my own and so the, the professor and the dean both look me in the eyes whenever they can tell that I'm struggling with this. And they ask me, like, well, like, what's the matter? Like, what, like, what are you going to do next? And I was like, I guess i got to tell my parents that I'm afraid to. And they're like, why? And I was like, well, the answer is because you know, I had let them down before with the whole um, dental school thing and dropping out of school. And, like, now we're, we're four, almost five years later. And on paper it looks like I'm doing really well and, she, and then both of them looked at me and they were like you know all a parent wants is to know that their kid is happy and healthy and they're like and are you any of those things like, and the answer was no I wasn't and so my mom came down to Morgantown approximately which is where WVU is approximately four days later it was for a football game I had gotten into some argument with my sister and of course, um, drug fueled. One part of the story that I didn't necessarily say was that, um, my sister, I found out later in my addiction, um, was actually using the same things that I was using. And so we started using together and, um, finances were definitely an issue between the two of us. So there was something that was drug fueled that happened where we got into an argument and she tried to play my mom against me or something. And I was like, okay, this is the moment I just got to tell her now. And so I sat my mom down and looked her in the eyes and I grabbed a hold of her knees. And I'll never forget the moment. It was in a hotel room. Grabbed her by her knees, sat her down, and I was like, I need to tell you something. And she, I could see it building up in her like she knew. I mean, mothers have this intuition. Like she knew what I was about to say before I even said it. And I told her that I was struggling with addiction and I couldn't do it on my own. And she asked me what it was. And I told her it was opiates. And she broke down and she cried and it was hard. Um, but she said, okay, let's get you help. You're, you're, you're coming home tonight. And so we went and packed up my apartment that day um, and headed back into Martinsburg, and I was going to try and detox at their house. And I didn't say that my sister was going through it. I figured it was on her um, to tell her own story. I just said what I was going through. And so um, it was about three days of me trying to do that. And, of course, I had relapsed, and... I started selling like my childhood toys, like my N64 and like all these action figures and stuff that were collectibles. And I started selling those things in order to support a habit there. Um, and then my sister came clean to my parents when she was by herself and she actually decided to go to Florida. So within five days of me admitting to it, my sister admits to it and is already in the treatment program. And I'm still holding on to the idea that like, I'm going to somehow magically get this thing through osmosis just because like I, I want to, but I'm not willing to put in the work. And so I'm, uh, I'm like lying. They think I'm clean. Um, and then my dad actually pulls me aside and looks at me. And he's like, you're still using. And I was like, no, I'm not. And he, he goes, don't lie to me. He's like, you, you, you don't lie. And I was like, okay, yeah, I am. 
And so he's like, we can't do this. Like we, I can't help you. You need to go somewhere where a professional can help you. And so I made a phone call and wound up at this place from Foundations Recovery Network, some conglomerate um, company. It was a really, really, really amazing place called La Paloma um, in Memphis, Tennessee. They had a music program, which is why my parents thought that that would be a good idea for me. Um, and so like, they had this recording studio and all this stuff. <clears throat> and so they, that's why they sent me there. And um, while I was in there for the first 30 days, I came out of my stupor and I started looking around and I, I couldn't believe that I was where I was. The first thing I did was I looked at my roommate who had told me that he had died and come back to life three different times. Um, you know, my next roommate after about three or four days uh, told me that he had been to jail multiple times and was facing 16 years if he didn't finish um, this program. Um, I'm in there with like 30 some year olds and 50 some year olds. And I'm thinking like, you know, <laughs> am I in the right place? Like, I mean, maybe all I had was, you know, this, this one issue with this one thing, because I was able to stop things like cocaine. I was able to stop things like LSD. I was able to not drink, um, every single day once I was getting deeper into the opiate addiction. And I was like, you know, maybe this isn't where I need to be. I didn't have any legal issues. I never died or anything before. Like, am I really in the right spot? And so as opposed to, you know, going there and really putting in the work, I started instantly trying to separate myself from other people, which coincidentally is the thing that led me there was because I felt separated from everybody, which is why I picked up that drug and continued to use it um, because I stopped caring about that feeling. But now I'm self-creating it. And so I'm creating this separation between me and everybody there. And I remember having this therapist, his name was Terry, and sitting across from him and he's telling me that you know i can never drink again i can never do any of these things again because i have an I have addiction and um that's something that applies to everything not just one substance and i'm at, i'm like sitting here listening to this guy tell me this and i'm like well are, are you sober and he goes no i'm not and i was like so do you drink and he goes yes i do and i was like so how are you going to tell me how to not drink if you've never successfully done it and so i'm disqualifying this man's information and him just trying to help me and one of the the downfalls i think for people that that are highly intelligent and it's a lot of people that suffer from alcoholism and addiction is that they are super highly intelligent is that we're able to disqualify the information from people that are trying to help us we can convince ourselves of anything and so um within i would say like 15 16 days of this 30-day program i'd already made the decision that i'm going i'm going to use again um, not necessarily opiates, but I'm not. Gonna, I'm definitely going to smoke weed at some point in my life. And I'm definitely going to drink alcohol at some point in my life, and um, it just became a waiting game until that could happen. And so, um, over the next 10, 10 15 days, um, my sister had gotten out of treatment in Florida and went back home, and we started emailing each other back and forth. And again, like we used together, and so she started saying that, you know, she had already relapsed on stuff. And I knew that I had this huge, um, amount of money that I still had that was coming in every month because of the way that I'd set my stuff up. And I was like, yeah, as soon as I get out, I'll transfer this money into your account and we can use it as soon as I get out. So I already set up my next relapse. And, um, when I got to the airport, the very first thing I did was order a beer and within four hours of that, um, I was I was using again, and my sister was only there for two days before she went back into another Florida program, and so I woke up on the second going on the third day, and I wasn't sick, and I was like I could stop right now. I could just stop, and then like everything would be better. I can get back into school, I can do all these things. And I was like, or I could keep using, and I was like, and if I keep using, I was like, I know I'm gonna have to run this thing all the way through to wherever it ends. I'm going to have to ride this road, whether that's in the back of a cop car or back in treatment. If I use today, like there's no stopping until it's over. And even having that mental clarity and knowing that, I still used. And I joined this outpatient program. Um, and I was lying and manipulating the entire time, passing these drug tests um, by the skin of my teeth because uh, I'd figured out a system to do it. And I'm not going to disclose that because I don't want anybody to cheat the system. Um, but 
whenever I was doing this outpatient, I just remember sitting there and like going into the bathroom while I'm learning about how to not use, I'm in the bathroom using. And um, I did this for about another month and a half. And the last 10 days of this particular run um, was probably the worst. Uh, I had figured out a way to manipulate and figure out a way to, to gain about $1,000 a day. And I was using every single cent of it on on alcohol or sorry on on opiates and alcohol too but mainly opiates and my addiction had gone from about eight pills a day um up to to 24 those last 10 days and i didn't realize the severity of what it was that i was doing to myself physically at the time i was smoking 24 pills a day off foil um and i remember on the seventh day of that like 10 day one thousand dollar day run i'm sitting up in my room because again, I'm in my parents' house who think that I'm clean, using 24 pills a day while they think I'm going to meetings and all this other stuff. I'm just lying and manipulating through my teeth. And I remember just like breaking down in tears in one moment, like looking up at the ceiling and praying. And I was like, God, when the time comes, whatever you put in my way, I will do it in order to get over this. I, I want to be finished with it. I just don't know how. So when, when you're ready, you let me know and I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. And I call that a foxhole prayer. <clears throat> but I meant it. I just didn't know how to build up the courage to, to let them down again. Um, and so it was three more days. And I remember on the 10th day, um, I was thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't go to the same bank and pull out $1,000 again. Maybe I should go to a different branch. Because, again, it's Martinsburg, so it's a really small town. Everybody knows everybody. And um, my dealer called me, and he was two minutes away from the branch that I normally went to. I was like, yeah, screw it. It doesn't matter. So I went through that same bank, and within seconds of me buying my my normal pickup, um, I had a text from my mom saying, you need to get home now. And my response was, was why? And she goes, because the bank called me and I know. And so now I'm panicking <laughs> and I'm like, well, I gotta, I better try to use as much as this is what I can. And the, the branch of the bank from my, from the bank to my house is like 12 minutes. It took me two hours to get home. So when I got home, my mom and my dad were both there. They hand me a drug test. I had probably 20 pills in my pocket. And they're like, you need to take this and you can't exit out of this closet till you take it. And they put me in a closet. And while I'm in, like, my, my addict mind was still thinking so hard, like, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, there has to be a way that I can pass this drug test while inside of this closet. Maybe I can, like, get some water. Um, and then, like, just, like, I only have the sweater on, so maybe I can pee on the sweater and get half of my pee. Um, and that would be the perfect amount of flow in order to be able to, like, throw the drug test. And, like, that's just how delusional I was. And so I knocked on the door after about an hour, sitting in there trying to figure out a way. And all the while I keep hearing this voice, like, this is your chance. This is the time. This is when it's supposed to happen. And so I knock on the door, and they open it up, and I was like, I can't take this test because I'll fail. And they sat me down, and then um, I was posed with two very real options. My dad sat me down at a table my mom on the other side and then he was like I don't know why you keep doing what you're doing but you can't do it here and you'll never do it here again um you know we're willing to get you a plane ticket a one-way plane ticket to anywhere that you want to go um but you're not going to do it here so you can be homeless there or you can be homeless here or you can try to get this thing right um but those are your only options and and again because I'm delusional and I'm not thinking clearly I was like okay well I'll just be homeless here and so I grabbed my keys and he goes "Whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second like you're underneath my insurance he's like so hand me those keys because if you get in trouble he's like i'm not gonna have you skyrocket my thing so i hand him the keys and i go towards the door and then i look outside and i think like it's january in west virginia how long am i really gonna make it out on the streets and so i make a phone call back to foundations recovery network and they're telling me on the phone they're like yeah we have a flight where you can either come in today um at 7 p.m mind like it's probably about two and Martinsburg, it takes about an hour to get to the airport. Um, and they're like, or you can come in tomorrow morning. My mom's like, you can make the flight tonight. And so I go upstairs and I pack a backpack. Um, and I get in the car and I still have, you know, my drugs in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, I guess this is it. And I'm going to use all these before I get there. 
And if I ever had any doubt that I was somebody who struggled with addiction, it was surely put to rest when I was crouched down in an airplane bathroom, smoking pills off of foil um, in federal airspace and knowing what I know about the law and knowing that I would have gone to jail for a very long time, about seven years for every pill I had in my pocket um, because I wasn't protected by any state law. So it was a federal crime. And that's whenever the realization really hit me where I was like, I'm a huge problem. And then it was quickly followed up by whenever I got to the detox that I was supposed to be at the same place I went through 60 days prior to like, you're back again. Like, yeah. And then they asked me how much it was that I was using. And I told them 24 pills a day on average, sometimes more. Um, and then when their mouths opened up, they're like, you're lucky to be alive with, with how much additives there are in those pills. And then they're like, well, there's no way we can give you anything to ease your, your withdrawals until at least 24 hours from now. You have way too much in your system. We'll just throw you into precipitated withdrawal. And so I was like, oh, man, this sucks. And I remember signing the paperwork and nodding out while I was signing the paperwork. So none of it really looked like my signature. Um, and I went in and I laid my head down. And that was on the 12th. And the first day that I remember waking up was on the 14th. And so that's what I consider my sobriety date. It was January 14th. And I, I, I didn't know how this time was going to be different, but I knew I wanted it to be different. And so the very first thing that I did with my first therapy session was I looked at the man who I had pretty much dismissed and, you know, acted as though I was smarter than him. And whether or not I was or I wasn't, is neither here nor there. This man had made a career out of helping people and I was throwing his help back in his face and I told him I was like I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't listen but this time I'm willing to do whatever it takes and, and I'm going to follow your suggestion and he could tell that I was being earnest and I was being honest and so I put I did everything that people suggested that I do there if they told me that I should do morning meditations then I was up for an hour doing morning meditations I was doing whatever I could do and um, my mom had called me at some point. She was like, your therapist thinks you should do a long-term program. And I think I found one. Um, it's a five-month program. It's all male. It's kind of like a, a fraternity, but they also work out. And they're, you know, you used to be so, so physically active. Um, she's like, I think this would be really good for you. And I was like, what's it called? She goes, it's called Treehouse Recovery. I was like, okay, I'll look it up. And she goes, well, I'm going to give you a number for a guy, and I want you to call him. I was like, yeah, I'm going to look it up first. So, again, still trying to maintain some level of control. And so I looked it up, and I was like, yeah, this is weird. All these people here look happy. Like, there's something wrong with this. This, is, this doesn't look real. But so I called the guy, and his name was Vecchi. I thought that was a really weird name, V-E-C-H-I. I think that's interesting. Um, so I called him up, and he and I got to talking. And I don't know what it was about this dude's demeanor. But he was like a no BS kind of guy. He kind of reminded me of my dad a little bit. Um, so, of course, I, you know, it was off-putting. And I wasn't too sure how I felt about him. And one of the things that he asked was, um, you know, aren't, aren't you tired of feeling the way that you've been feeling? You know, and, and that, that void that you have within yourself that you keep trying to fill up with, with accolades, with all this stuff. is like, don't you just want to feel peace from that? And that really hit home for me because that's why I started using it in the first place. It's because I didn't care about any of those feelings. Um, and I didn't want to notice that hole. But that hole started growing larger and larger and larger the more substances I was trying to fill into it. I was like, yeah, I do. And he's like, well, he's like, then I think that this might be a good place for you. And so then I started throwing out a bunch of questions like, well, you know, what if I don't necessarily need five months? And, you know, what about having, like, my laptop and this and that and that? And he's like... Jake, it doesn't sound like you're serious. He's like, you know, you, you have all these grand ideas about how you can stay sober, but yet you just admitted to me that you couldn't even get one day um, out of a structured environment sober by yourself. I was like, man, he got me. He's like, you know what? You call me back whenever you're serious. And he hung up the phone. And I was like, it was the first time I had ever uh, been denied anything. So again, throughout my life, it was like I had to try out for jazz band, I got it. I had to try out for show choir, and I got it. I had to, you know, prove myself in order to be a varsity football player. Did it super young. Um, had to prove myself in order to become um, accepted into that pre-accepted into dental school at age 18. Had to prove myself in order to become um, a national model United Nations delegate. Same thing with student government. Same thing with vice president. Same thing with law school. 
and I had always done it. And this was the very first time I had ever gone for something and I'd been told I wasn't good enough. And for whatever reason, that fueled a passion within me. And I remember um, <laughs> that prayer that I had, that foxhole prayer, and God telling me in that moment, like, this was it. And you just blew it. Like, this was me telling you what you needed to do and putting this in your way, and you blew it. And so I called my mom. I was like, yeah, he said, I'm good. I don't need to go in there. And she goes, really? I was like, no, it's, it's exactly where I need to be. It's the first place that's ever called me out on my BS. And then so I asked her if she could try to call him and see if he would call me back. And uh, she did. And then two days later, he did. I was still at this 30-day facility. And I told him, I was like, I don't care what it is. If you tell me to hop on one foot up and down and pat my head with one hand and rub my stomach with the other, and you tell me to do that for an hour, I'm going to do it for two because like, that's how bad I want this. He goes, I believe you, but you don't have to convince me. you got to remind yourself, and you got to convince this team. And so I flew to California um, with my mom. The very first thing that I did was I like looked around at the, at the place, and I instantly started saying things like, I can't really be here for five months, and I felt that happening. And like what I know now about the brain is that that was my amygdala, the part of me that's responsible for fight or flight, the part of me that's been controlled for the last so many years of my life by my addiction, screaming out, trying to keep my addiction alive, telling me reasons as to why this isn't going to work. Whenever in my prefrontal cortex, what's responsible for logic, reasoning, and connection to people is yearning, trying to get me to, to stay and saying this is exactly where you need to be and I was fighting that feeling and I get told on a Friday that I have to interview on a Monday and so for somebody with anxiety I was tripping out for three days about having that back and forth between my brain having one side of my brain telling me you don't need to do this and having another side of my brain tell me this is exactly where you need to be and I was battling it so much for three days and when I finally sat down in front of that team it was a group of guys that I looked around and um, I wasn't looking for the things that made me made me different. I was actually trying to look for the things that made me the same. And that was different from, a, from a, a recovery group that I had been in before. And so when I sat down, the very first thing that they asked me is, you know, what positive character traits can you bring to this team? And... You know, I searched my head, and they had already known a little bit about who I was and what it was that I was about, and I was like really searching for what I thought positive about myself at the time. And I just shook my head, and I looked down, and I couldn't think of anything. And so I got up, and I walked out. And in that moment, I, I, I remember thinking, like, man, I think so low of myself that like I'm blowing an interview and I've never blown it. I've always gotten the job. I've always passed the interview process and I'm like, I'm blowing an interview. I was like, I can't think of anything positive about myself. And then just as soon as Betsy was about to come over to me and ask me what happened, every single member of that team walked out and they're like, why did you get up and walk away? And I was like, because I don't see anything positive in myself right now. And I was like, and if that's okay with you, then like, I'd love to be on your team. I was like, but if, I have to have an answer I was like I just don't I just don't have one and they're like do you want to finish the interview and I was like yeah I do and they brought me into the room and I finished the interview and I made it onto the team and now I know the reason why that interview process is in place um, it's to build a success because a lot of people have that feeling a lot of people go in there with that feeling of like I don't know what positive I can bring to anything in life right now. I've been losing for so long. Like, how could I possibly win? And so we build a success right off the bat for you. And then that momentum needs to be carried out by the provider day in and day out. And the client who's in the shoes has the opportunity to participate in those wins day in and day out. And then build on that success and build that confidence and build that empowerment. And then that's what leads to success called positive-based psychology rather than working from a problem-based psychology model that states that you have to work through every single negative life instance that you've ever had in order to have a successful life positive-based psychology states that, like let's start with today and I'd like to build on it from there and that's what treehouse did for me and it was a five-month program but um the thing that i kept thinking in my head was that like i need to get back to law school I remember this guy who had been homeless and living underneath of a bridge who was on my team. Um, 
no joke that's what he was doing he was 20 23 year old kid and um he he would live this insane lifestyle that normally you know it takes people decades to get to he looked at me and he was like why are you in such a rush to feel better i didn't have an answer and he was like what if you just took the time to really figure this thing out this time I was like, sounds like a good idea. And then again, like that was that feeling of that prayer that I had in me feeling like it was God talking to me again and saying, this is your chance. Listen. So I did. And what was supposed to be a five month process wound up turning into six months before I graduated. And the day before I graduated, I was offered to do an assistant housing manager position. And I'm like, well, if I sign on to this, I'm signing up for at least a six month commitment, which means I'll be out here for a year. Um, and then again, I had that feeling like do it. So I did. And, you know, being an assistant manager turned into managing my own house. Um, Within two months of graduating the program, uh, the owner of the company called me up and he was like, I know that you want to go back to law school. He's like, but have you ever thought about working for us for a little while? And I was, you know, kind of put off guard. I was like, well, you know, I don't have six months clean um, out of the program, which is typically what you need to work for a treehouse. And he's like, no, he's like, you're a special case. He's like, I'm building up something called the this admissions department. He's like, and I want you to be a part of it um, if you want to. And I was like, okay, um, I'll put in an application. And I thought it was going to be some glorified secretary's position where I just like answer phone calls and like try to direct them into treatment. And during my interview, I, I stayed. I was like, that's not what I want to do. And they were like, that's not what you're going to be doing. You're going to be guiding people from the from the point when they first call. He's like, think about what Betsy did for you. I think that's what you're going to be doing every single day. He's like, and it may not always be treehouse, it might have to be somewhere else. He's like, but you're going to be the first sign of hope that these people have heard in a long time. And then again, I felt that voice, do it. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And so I built up an admissions department, and that was um, three years ago, or a little bit, a little bit over three years ago, going on four years now. Um, and I started building that up in it. You know, at first it was a struggle and trying to figure out how I could help people because, you know, I was intellectualizing things and um, I didn't know what all I was doing. And then it happened and I, and I got I got one person um, from point A to point B and it, did, it wasn't Treehouse, but it was somewhere else. And I heard the, the voice of a mother um, come back over the phone and say, thank you. Like you may have just saved my son's life. And then I, I heard her break down and cry, and then I imagined my mom on the phone with Betsy. And I imagined all the turmoil that I would put my mother through, that I put my family through for that last like six-month stretch wherever I was in and out of treatment and, and failing and lying. And I called my mom, and I told her what had happened. And she was like, if you want to make it up to me in any way, she's like, then, then just keep doing what you're doing right now. So I made the commitment that I would. And... You know, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, like, I need to get back to law school. Um, But I was like, I'm going to give it my all. And so I started learning more about just the the human factor of things, like not being numbers-driven or results-driven, but but really being people-driven and helping people see the value in themselves so then they can enter into these situations, like feeling empowered and feeling excited about the next phase of their life. And so I put my all into it. And... I became a professional success coach and certified professional success coach, certified peer recovery coach, got my certified drug and alcohol counselors um, certification so then I can help people better. I want to help people. And I realized that over the course of my entire life, whether it was music or whether it was student government or whenever it was um, like law or whatever it was, the health field, that my ultimate passion came from, from, from helping people. Like that's what I really wanted. That's what made me feel good. Was, was making other people feel better about their life situation in some shape, way, or form. I wanted to give back. And my deadline for the law school thing was coming up and fast approaching. And I wasn't sure what all to do with it. I've been working for Treehouse for almost three years at this point. And so um, I decided to go back to school and um, not like go back, go back, but go travel back and you know, go see what it looked like in order to get the process started. And I made an effort to really make sure that I went to go see that teacher, the one who started the whole entire process for me. And I sat down in her office and she and I were talking back and forth and she looked at me and she's like, do you really want to be an attorney? She's like, everything that you're telling me that you're doing, it sounds so amazing. And it's like, you're excited about it. She's like, do you really want to practice law? 
and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and she was like, well, I'm telling you, before you get into this, she's like, you should really be sure of that. She's like, because you're passionate about this. I can see it in your eyes right now. And then she's like, before I was an attorney, is that I knew I wanted to be a teacher. But I knew I wanted to be a teacher um, of a certain caliber. So that's why I went and became um, an attorney and got my legal education. She's like, what is it that you want to do? I didn't have an answer, but this woman who had set my entire journey on one path in the very beginning is now course correcting me again. <laughs> and it's super serendipitous because she was actually on her way out and retiring. And that was her, I think it was her last week there. It was the, it was the end of May. So that was like her last week there before she was cleaning out her office. And so it was, it just so happened it lined up that way. And, uh, you know, at this point in time, my grandfather's super sick, um, with cancer and so I didn't know it at the time. This would be the actually um, the last time I would ever see him healthy. And he said the same thing. He's like, Chick, I'm so proud of you. He's like, it sounds like that you're really happy now. And he's like, the only thing I ask is that you keep making sure that you're happy and you do what's right for you. And in the background this whole time, I, I had met um, this wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, her name's Patricia. And like, I wasn't sure what it was, but. Um, something was telling me like it's not time to go yet like just just a little bit longer just wait here just a little bit longer and so I was like you know if everything works out then I'll go and uh, I'll go back in January and so I pursued this relationship with this woman and um, you know, she and I got talking and like you know we really found this connection and then in July my grandfather was on his deathbed and I was going I asked her I don't know why it struck me but I was like will you come back with me <laughs> And she said, yeah. And as I was in the room with my grandfather taking his last breath, I look, I look over and I look down the hallway and it's my grandmother coming down the hall with Patricia and my grandmother has her head on Patricia's arm. And I was like, it was like the clouds had parted and like, you know, there was this beaming light coming down and I was like, this is it. Like she's the one that I'm supposed to be with for the rest of my life. I know it. And so when we went back, I, I was on the plane, and I was like, what would you say if I asked you to marry me? And she's like, I'd say yes. Like, like just so sure, um, not, not a single ounce of doubt in her mind. And so the next day, I asked her if she would marry me, and she said yes. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was about another, like, three or four months of us figuring out what it is that we were going to do um, in terms of, like, do I go back to school, do I not? And then all these amazing things started happening for me, just as I was, like, about to make a compromise on my life and, and do these things that like I, I knew I wasn't really destined to do. It was like things started happening with professional recovery coaching. Things started ha happening with professional success coaching. Um, I started getting opportunities to go and speak and tell my testimony. Um, a, a lot of amazing things started happening for me. And I was like, I don't think that this is my calling. And she's like, yeah, I don't know if it is either, but you need to be sure. And I made a decision then and there. I was like, I'm, I'm going to do, I think, I think that my life is supposed to be helping others through this way and like sharing my story. So then my story, even though, and I'm not naive, I know it's not the worst that there ever was, but hopefully it can be. Like hopefully my story is the worst it ever gets for somebody by me sharing it. And then other people don't have to go through the same suffering. In my home state right now, in West Virginia, it's the worst in terms of the opioid epidemic. In my home city, Martinsburg, West Virginia, it, it passed Baltimore in terms of overdose deaths. Maybe my story can be the worst it ever gets for people there. And like I've been able to help people from my hometown. I've been able to make those connections. And like I actually just recently got back from doing a series of speeches at West Virginia University, um, my alma mater. I went and spoke to um, law students, people that were actually in student government whenever I was vice president. I'm going there and talking to them about substance abuse and telling them how lawyers actually have the highest propensity for being depressed and struggling with alcoholism and substance abuse. One in three people suffer from that in the legal profession. And it's like, I, I remember all the way back to whenever I needed to feel like I belonged. And I remember all the way back to whenever that, and it was essentially, I was a kid and like really knowing that I was, I was different in some shape, way or form. And, and like, and, and wanting to feel like I belonged somewhere and wanting to feel like I had a place in the world. And now I think about who I am today. I was like, you know, maybe being different isn't such a bad thing. And like having having peace with that, 
is where the true power comes. And, and, and there's no mistake about it. I know that in my life, if it wasn't for, you know, for, for that prayer and that constant voice inside of my head that I believe was the spirit, like coming to me and telling me, like, do the right thing. If that hadn't happened, I don't think I would be here today. You know, I, I am definitely the sum accumulation of a lot of people's best intention for me, as well as my, my hard work bringing good luck, and as well as just God putting the right people and the right things in my way at the right time, me being able to take advantage of those things. You know, and I realize now that, like, by me being different, I can help the other people who feel different. You know, I'm coming up on five years clean and sober. Um, I've been helping people for, for over four years get, get this thing taken care of. And, like, you know, I, 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 I coach people um, through professional success coaching that doesn't even have to do with recovery because, I'm, you know, I, I've figured out a way to be truly at self-peace and really tried to, and really figured out a way to cognitively restructure my brain through positive neurochemistry. And so, I mean, I help people that aren't addicts feel at peace. Not everybody chooses a substance. Other people choose work. Um, other people choose self-deprecating acts. But I, I have now taken what I've learned, and, you know, my choice was to use substances, but I've now taken what I've learned and helped other people um, who not who don't necessarily just struggle with substance. Um, I've helped a lot, a lot, a lot of families, and I've, and I've heard that saying time and time and time again. Jake, you're like you've saved my life, or Jake, you've saved my son's life, or Jake, thank you for giving us hope. And you know, it every single time it never loses its gravity on me, and that's what keeps me going. That's why I named my company Hope Guides, because that that's what fuels me is giving other people hope. I still work for Treehouse Recovery. Um, it's an it's a program that focuses on physical activity rather than focusing on. Um, you know, medications and trying to, to sidestep the problem. Like we take harvest of the brain's natural pharmacy through physical activity. Um, we, we, we don't necessarily focus on um, problem-based psychology. We do, but we, we really put an emphasis on positive-based psychology. And I've taken that and I've ran with it. And I have I've been doing both of those things for a while now. But on top of all that, like my – what really um, – you know, inspires me and like makes me work as hard as what I do is, you know, my, my beautiful partner and my, my new child. I just, um, we just welcomed a baby girl. Her name's Jolie and into the world, uh, five months ago, actually today. And so, you know, when I think about where I was feeling as though I didn't belong and just wanting, wanting to be okay with who I was, um, when I think about what I have now, and I think about the journey that it took to get here, um, I wouldn't change anything. The only thing I, I, I maybe wish I would have done would have been like not fight it so much. Um, but everything happens for a reason. And if there is anybody that's hearing this that you know is struggling that's out there, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And Shane, is it okay if I give my information? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you can reach me by email at, at, at Jacob period E as an echo. So that's J A C O B dot E at hope guides, H O P E G U I D E S dot com. Or, um, you can also reach me by phone at three zero four eight three nine five four four eight. And I would, I would love to help you in the next step or help anybody that, that you are, um, that you may know who's struggling, I would I would love to help. Um, it's what fuels me, and I know that you know sometimes the first conversation is the hardest, but the first conversation is what fuels the rest. I know that was the case for me, because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for one person knowing the right thing to say at the right time, and and, and that's what I truly pride myself in being able to do is be that person for other people now, because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that teacher. Twice, my life wouldn't be the way that it is. So uh, I'd love to help anybody.